Welcome to RHI's Sociable City Interviews, where we meet with global thought leaders on nightlife and the social economy. Today, we are here with Josh Levin, a pioneer in the recent nighttime governance movement, trading in the co-ownership of three restaurants to become the coordinator of the DC Hospitality Resource Panel in 2000. The panel was a voluntary advisory and adv advocacy alliance working to improve DC's governance. In this interview, Josh reveals his initial resistance as an operator representative of the Restaurant Association of Metropolitan Washington. And then he advanced several collaborative initiatives on waste management and venue security training when he transitioned to the panel coordinator. The interview jumps ahead to his career as an independent theater operator and film distributor. Well, Josh, it's great to see you again and great to have this opportunity to catch up. We, we, we do have a long history that goes back quite a ways and been a number of years in between, but I've always admired you and your ability to see things that other people don't see. It's, it's, it's Jonathan Swift quote, you know, his quote, um, um, vision is the ability to see the invisible, you know, and you've always been in that position, in my opinion as somebody who could see trends and see things happening. Um, but why don't you just give a little bit of a background of who you are and how you got into doing not only what you did back then, and we'll get into more specifics about what happened when we first met, but just uh, generally speaking, like a bird's eye view of who you are and your background. So I'm Josh Levin. I'm a fifth generation native Washingtonian, Washington, DC, not the state. Um, my dream as a kid was to have my own restaurant, and in my mid-20s, I had uh, the first opportunity to get involved in opening a new restaurant. From the moment we started uh, the process of opening what would be the first of three restaurant bars that I owned in Washington, D.C., we ran into all kinds of regulatory hurdles, which I'm sure you and I will talk about in greater detail uh, during this conversation. But that uh, experience, uh, in part, helped inform the next stage of my evolution, which was after being a bar and restaurant owner for several years, I got involved with the Responsible Hospitality Institute and ended up transitioning out of the restaurant ownership side of things and served as the coordinator for RHI in Washington, D.C. Um, I then made another career shift. Uh, moved to New York and started working in the independent film industry, which I am still working in all these years later. But in between, I moved back to DC and opened a different kind of hospitality business, an independent movie theater called West End Cinema, which I owned and operated for five years. Mm -hmm. I'm now no longer in DC or New York. I'm now a suburban house husband. Uh, who works in film distribution. Wow, that's quite a career. It covers a whole gauntlet of things. So when you mentioned that you first got involved in RHI, I think it was probably around 2000 or so, mm -hmm. and you were actively involved with your restaurants, and we were you know, taking this concept of a hospitality resource panel that we developed in the 90s in San Diego, and we're trying to introduce it to different cities. And we were also working more closely with business improvement districts, which is how we kind of came into contact with um, um, the, the folks at the downtown DC bid. And we, we proposed uh, that we would start a, a project there. And we started to organize representatives from different sectors of the community to be involved in this process, forming what we call a hospitality resource panel and we were managing it remotely. Um, and then uh, Diageo came along and, and offered to provide some funding. And you were a member of this uh, uh, group that was starting to come together in an advisory role. And we had you and Abra and police and resident groups and some of the bids. Um, and you came on as a restaurant operator um, and you were sitting at this table with all these different people. What was your state of mind at that point? I heard this process with hostility in my heart. Um, you mentioned, or, or as we mentioned, I was a restaurant owner. 
and felt like I had received uh, an inordinate amount of flack uh, from different regulatory elected law enforcement, other types of entities in DC uh, in the process of opening, owning and operating my restaurants. I felt very much uh, the victim. I felt like I was operating within a system that was hostile to restaurants and bars uh, and to small business owners. Um, and I felt like the deck was definitely stacked against me. Um, during the time I was involved in owning restaurants, I joined the board of the uh, Restaurant Association of Metropolitan Washington, which is how I first heard about your endeavor and went as a representative along with a woman named Lynn Bro, uh, who was uh, at one point the head of the Restaurant Association. Uh, to, to listen to what you had to say. And I ended up volunteering to represent restaurant interests in your initial endeavor in DC. And it's when I learned my first real lesson in the myopia that I brought uh, to this endeavor. Uh, it was at the very first meeting. I don't remember the exact verbiage of what I said is, said was, but the, the gist of it was, well, the one thing we can all agree on is that the deck is stacked against the restaurants, at which point all the people representing neighborhood associations and advisory neighborhood commissions, and citizens groups, all collectively screened. And uh, once we got past the initial, no, I have it worse than you, no, you have it worse than me, I, I actually started listening. Um, I realized that it was, it was a... 360 degree problem where all of the stakeholders felt that they were disadvantaged and none of the stakeholders seemed to be actively working towards solutions. People were very entrenched, including myself, in the, uh, the trench warfare that was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a nutshell, for people who aren't familiar with what we're talking about, the restaurants and bars that I represented at that time felt like the regulations were designed to keep us from successfully operating the business. Felt like the neighbors had inordinate power to affect whether or not we got liquor licenses, what hours we could operate, um, what specials or, or menu offerings we could present to our clients. Uh, the usual complaints about noise and um, uh, pedestrian traffic and impact on parking, uh, we felt like we received all these slings and arrows from people who should appreciate the fact that we were providing nighttime entertainment and hospitality, that should appreciate that we were generating tax revenue for the city, that should appreciate that we were uh, productively uh, employing lots of people, um, et cetera, et cetera. I felt like I as a restaurateur, I was bringing all of these amenities uh, and benefits to the community and was greeted with nothing but hostility from the organized and semi-organized uh, representatives of those communities. So you, so you felt kind of um, like a victim of all of this when you felt like you were making a really big contribution that wasn't being recognized, <clears throat> that you right. weren't being appreciated or that your industry sector wasn't being appreciated. And, yes. and so, so when did you, you know, as we began to look to set up a staff position here um, and hire somebody who would kind of be this liaison and actually help facilitate the dialogue, how did you, you know, begin to morph into Hmm, maybe this is something I would rather do than operate my restaurants because clearly it would have been a conflict for you to be both an owner and a facilitator of this process. So yeah. when did you kind of wake up in the middle of the night and say, aha, this is something that I think I could do? Well, I think the, the order of things was I woke up one night and realized I've been working 100 hours a week for, for six or seven years and was not going to survive much longer doing that. And, and uh, was able to successfully arrange to um, sell my interests in the, the establishments 
leave on good uh, terms with my partners, which was very important to me and is still to this day, all these years later, uh, and have something productive to transition to. And having started uh, my involvement in the process with the, the hospitality resource panel and knowing that you were looking for somebody to be the local coordinator and having already forged better relationships with the people that I initially viewed as enemies or as hostile agents. Uh, you know, the, the confluence of circumstance really lent itself uh, to me jumping at the opportunity and try to do something constructive with what had been a, uh, a very uh, non-constructive uh, system or lack of system in how hospitality uh, businesses were created, licensed, and run in my hometown. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so thanks both to you and to the downtown DC Business Improvement District working together, uh, you were able to create essentially a full-time position for me. And, uh, you know, my last night Slinging beers was a Saturday night, and my first day at the office was Monday morning. Mm -hmm. So I took a one-day vacation and bought some new outfits. In your role, then, you, you really began to define uh, what today has become, uh, you know, a professional position in cities <clears throat> as a liaison, that really the functional role is to not solve all the problems but to be a liaison to help build the bridges to help solve some of those problems. And there were a number of initiatives that you undertook and you, you drew attention to a lot of the needs for moving forward. And, and uh, you know, you had people like Lynn Bro and, and Natalie Avery and other people that were involved in those early stages eventually become advocates for a more formal system within the city that mm -hmm. created the Office of Nightlife and Culture with staff that are now creating these uh, working partnerships to address some of the gaps that you felt people were blaming on the industry, but that really were systemic. And some of those like late night transportation systems or you know, interagency collaboration and cooperation to help businesses succeed instead of trying to get them to be closed down. These have now evolved to become a culture, but at the time that wasn't the culture. I, I, I don't want to uh, bring this up, but I will anyhow. One of your great accomplishments was in Georgetown, where there was a lot of residents in uproar over the rat problem, which they were all blaming on the on the restaurants. And you were creative in getting all the different stakeholders together to see the cause of the problem and to come up with a solution. I don't know if you recall that, but from my perspective, that was like an amazing ability to be a liaison to got the that got the trash haulers and the pest control companies and the restaurants all to come together to see a way in which they could solve a problem that wasn't obvious. You know, again, like I said, vision is the ability to see the invisible. And that's something you brought to that particular situation. You're making me smile because I, I am distinctly remembering uh, a, a gathering in which uh, it was explained to a rapt audience the effect of restaurant grease on the libido of rats. <laughs> um, really held the audience's attention. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the you mentioned Georgetown specifically. For those who haven't been to D.C., Georgetown is is uh, a city within Washington D.C. that is older than Washington. Uh, it was founded in the late 16, early 1700s. It's on the banks of the Potomac River, so you have an old infrastructure by water, both of which lend themselves to rat infestation. You have a very tight concentration, not only of hospitality establishments, but residences and institutions. All of these things are contributing factors. And instead of there being a coordinated effort um, across all of the stakeholders to address a systemic problem, there was a lot of time spent pointing fingers. Well, the restaurants are too sloppy with their trash and grease. 
well, the residents take no responsibility for leaving their trash out twice a week, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, people were blaming Georgetown University. People were blaming the big hotels. People were blaming, uh, at that time, the big parking lot that lined the banks of the Potomac, which is now a multi gazillion dollar real estate development, but at the time was just untended um, asphalt with bushes that provided housing for rats. Um, and it was really getting people together and seeing, first of all, that you can't just point the finger in any one direction and find the, the source of a problem when you have a systemic problem. And second, figuring out ways to work together to actually solve the problem or at least mitigate. I mean, there are still rats, but is it the same crisis it was? No. You know, working together, making restaurant uh, and, and, and hotel operators more cognizant of best practices, working with the trash haulers and, and the grease haulers. Um, working with the residents, working with the institutions, working with the city, it improved the situation. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things I learned from you is you can't solve all the problems immediately and there is no such thing as perfect, but if you can start making improvements in small tangible areas, it fosters more cooperation, it, it creates um a benchmark of success it proves as an exemplar of the value of these sorts of joint efforts and reduces some of the hostility and based on my own personal experience coming into this as a hostile party um reducing that hostility really allows you to open your ears mm. yeah well and, said and, 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 and at least appreciate and respect the other party's position and see if there aren't things that can be done. One of the other initiatives when I was the coordinator uh, was addressing a law enforcement concern that uh, security at some of the bars and nightclubs um, were uh, themselves committing crimes by violently expelling people right so instead of solving problems they were essentially beating people up and so we put together we got a security expert who agreed to to work as a volunteer we went into trainings um i don't know if the downtown dc business improvement district was thrilled that i was going to strip clubs um to to talk to bouncers but you know that was one segment of the industry where there were a lot of violent altercations and uh you know we went and addressed it the the dance clubs in dc the places that really don't start doing business until 1 a.m saturday morning uh you know seem to frequently have confrontations between security and patrons we went and worked with a bunch of them we didn't solve every problem but we certainly improved training uh we try to change the uh, the outlook uh, from security, from one of uh, knocking people out and throwing them out to um, ease intention and, mm -hmm. and, and finding uh, nonviolent intervention. Yeah, and, that, that whole de-escalation is becoming critically uh, important in particular now that you're introducing guns into these types of settings and the potential mm -hmm. violence, not only in the venues, but outside. And also the fact that uh, there's been a trend more towards better security within venues and venues still being blamed for the types of violence that's occurring on the street, <clears throat> which they don't have necessarily a lot of control over. So let's transition uh, <clears throat> to the, the independent movie, uh, movie world mm -hmm. that you got involved with. And you know, clearly, <clears throat> theaters have always been a catalyst for vibrancy in, in downtowns and in cities, and they can help to spur the growth of restaurants and other types of social venues. Um, and you were involved in, in doing some of that. Um, and you've also witnessed um, 
you know, how that whole sector has changed. And just like musicians, you know, it's the small independent music venues that give the rising performers those practice sessions to prepare themselves for larger venues. Um, and movie theaters, you know, in some ways create those opportunities for uh, new uh, people entering into the independent or the film industry. So, so what we, we don't have much time left, but I think you could bring some insights as to the whole role of the theater, what role it's currently playing now that it's being, you know, reorganized. And and where do you see that that independent theater <clears throat> and the opportunity for the independent uh, filmmakers to showcase their work, which which basically has has been lost in some ways. The film industry, like the music industry, like so many other industries, um, you know, is in constant pressure from technology. And in the case of movie theaters, the streaming technology caused a major major disruption in how business used to occur. And, um, you know, we can talk about the impact of the pandemic on movie theaters as well as other hospitality venues. But even before the pandemic, theaters and small chains, locally owned uh, chains were going out of business because the, the technolo technological disruption of streaming was already causing um, chaos. And then the uh, pandemic lockdown just put that chaos on steroids. For almost 100 years, people viewed going to the movies as a convenient and inexpensive form of entertainment. And neither of those statements are true today for the vast majority, especially people under 40, whose idea of convenience is watching stuff on their phone. And certainly as ticket prices have gone up, even though the movie industry people will tell you compared to concerts and sports events, um, movie ticket prices have remained affordable. It doesn't feel that way when you have bought four tickets and then uh, taking out a second mortgage on your home to get popcorn and sodas for the kids. And, you know, the idea of leaving your home, getting a babysitter, driving your car, parking your car, going into the theater, turning off your devices, standing in line for your popcorn and soda, going to your seat, watching what feels like a half hour of commercials and trailers, and then watching a film that maybe you feel is rather cookie cutter because so much of what people consume these days are superheroes and sequels and franchises. Um, it does not feel convenient. It does not feel convenient that you can't pause the movie to take a bathroom break. Whereas if you're home and you're looking at your 55 to 80 inch TV, you pause it whenever you want. It is uh, no longer. Um, the uh, value proposition that it had been for damn near a century. Thus, it makes it harder for people to go to the theater. Then there's the uh, in-theater experience, which uh, I caught the tail end of, and you perhaps enjoyed the, uh, the golden age of movie palaces. These places were special. The staff was dressed up. The, the screen was massive. Um, often theaters had themes, the Egyptian theater, the uh, Parisian theater, um, and it was all uh, part of this wonderful escapist experience. Once the chains got involved and it went from single screen theater to multi screen theater, the in theater experience became rather blase. So that element of that special event also dissipated. Mm. But ultimately, you know, people make independent value propositions. Do I want to leave the house? This is something that you taught me early on in my experience with RHI. People make a fundal, fundamental decision. Are we going out? Or are we staying in? And if they make the decision to go out, you have to give them something special to go to. 
Mm -hmm. And for too many people, the movie theater going experience no longer felt special. Now, coming out of the pandemic, some of the indicators are that business will pick up. It seems like every week the success of The Flash or Spider-Man indicates doom or glee for the theater exhibitors. But the independent theaters are really struggling. And to get back to your question about where the artists, people who want to make the independent films, who then get to perhaps have careers in film go if their films can't go into theaters, the answer is they go to the streamers. But the problem there is that streaming audiences are series binge audiences. It's harder and harder to place independent film, especially independent film without recognizable talent, on just the major streaming platforms because it's they're not making money with those. So um, much like the independent musicians, it becomes uh, uh, for, for independent filmmakers to really find audience, it, it's hands-on involvement because the, the structures that used to help promote uh, the independent films is, is cracked, if not crumbled. Mm -hmm. and, and it's hard to envision right now anything approaching a return to the normal CBA. Wow, that seems to paint a gloomy picture <clears throat> for those who are struggling to try to make it. And, 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 but at the same time, you know, there'll come a point when people will grow tired of, like you said, these sequels and these other things. It's, 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 it's just, you want something richer, you know, it's, it's, you go from jello to, uh, to cream brulee, you know, I mean, sometimes the cream brulee is really what makes it worthwhile to go through what it takes to get there. Um, but, you know, I, I guess it'll, it's a challenge and obviously one that you're facing really representing the, the independent uh, movie theaters. So not the movie producers. So, so Josh, this has been, you know, it's been fascinating because you were able to paint a picture that really encapsulates um, lessons learned in a very short period of time that transfer over to today of how these new kind of directors of offices of nightlife or nighttime economy managers need to interpret their positions, but also how to recognize the, uh, 